कभी करती हैं मुलाकातें कभी करती हैं मुलाकातें कभी यादों में बरसाते किताबें करती हैं बातें किताबें करती हैं बातें मन की गहरी झील में कूद जाती हैं कभी सोच के दरिया के संग संग बहती जाती हैं कभी चाहे शाम हो या हो रातें किताबें करती हैं बातें हेलो एंड वेलकम टू किताब नामा बुक्स इन बियॉन्ड आई एम हियर विद समन सुब्रमण्यन ऑथर ऑफ फॉलोइंग फिश um a book of travel stories from around the indian coast and this divided island stories from the sri lankan war samant hi congratulations on the publication of this divided island this month thank you it's very nice to be here uh both your books are books of remarkable ambition but in very different ways and i'd like to start by talking about the first one following fish which uh saw you travel down and up the seaboards of india um and to produce a remarkable cultural travelogue about what india looks like from its coasts what drew you to that well it came about in a very uh, a very boring way actually i mean it came about because the publishers approached me and asked if i would be interested in writing a travelogue about the coast but i i knew instantly when i accepted the assignment that i didn't want to make it a book that told somebody how to travel that told people to go here or to do this or to eat that <laughs> uh i was more interested in doing what i've always been doing which is journalism which is just to go down and find people talk to them uh and figure out where their stories uh fit within sort of the larger cultural tapestry that is india and the coast was interesting and helpful because it is bounded you know it starts at bengal and it ends in gujarat and mm-hmm. there's nowhere else to go it's a very finite set of people and locations and geography uh and so that was the initial attraction i think that i could just kind of uh work my way around this coastline and find what there was to find that i didn't have to decide or predecide what attracted me to a particular place and what a multitude of cultures you found right it's huge i mean it uh, you know the whole the cliche about india is that <laughs> culture and food and language changes across 100 kilometers you travel in 100 kilometers and you come across a different set of people altogether speaking another tongue and eating another type of food uh, uh but the way in which the people on the coast relate to the sea and the way in which this bond sort of forges so much in their world i mean their their culture their language their history their religion their food which is a huge part of following fish mm. uh this was the, this was what was interesting to explore um and um it it came to be that you could kind of fit all these blocks together and you could give you an idea of what india is like at its edges and since you mentioned food and it's a subject of near universal interest mm-hmm. uh it's also interesting that you chose the fish as the central conceit of this book yeah. which among other reasons is why the book is titled following fish <laughs> yeah uh and much of what i remember about the book every time i read it is its approach to food and your delight in discovering how cuisine can change from well kilometer to kilometer yeah yeah isn't it yeah i mean fish is at the heart of these worlds right i mean the coastal population sort of depend on the uh, on fishermen for livelihoods and fish is at the heart of their cuisine um and i initially when i started out writing the book i did initially toy with the idea of just making it all about food mm. uh because food is such a nimble kind of subject i mean it allows you to explore culture and religion and all these other things that we just talked about uh and yet at the center of it is this hugely sensual kind of uh act of eating of mm. enjoying what you eat uh and so initially this, so this is uh, you know it turned out that roughly a third of the book was about food in the <laughs> final analysis but i did at some point you know inspired by these great masters of food writing like like aj liebling of the new yorker who just ate his way around france when he was a correspondent there uh you know i inspired by these guys i just wanted to at some point just write about food and write about it with this kind of baroque enjoyment you know which is the only way to write about food i think i think you one of the great successes of following fish was that it showed us that beyond the rural 
urban or other sorts of divides, um, we, which are the frameworks that we use to understand a country or a region, uh, you were able to show us that the coast more than, more than anything else is, um, is a geography of possibility, of adventure, yeah. uh, you know, of, of joy and discovery <coughs> and commerce. Yeah. You moved from that to a very different setting for your second book, This Divided Island, although that's not geographically very far from mm -hmm. India. What was it like as a journalist moving from this joyous travelogue to the weighty subject of uh, telling the stories of a country in the wake of a civil war? Uh, there's two answers to this. I mean, the first is that the move, I mean, you know, I've always been sort of entranced by the civil war in Sri Lanka. I mean, I grew up in Tamil Nadu, and hmm. so the war was always, so to speak, at my doorstep. And you would always read about the war in sort of large headlines. And the reason I chose to sort of write the book is, uh, however, a little bit, m it's a little bit more boring. I mean, I, I wrote it because I was curious. I mean, it was, you know, there was, uh, there was some attempt, or I, at least I thought about it when I was writing this book, is to sort of find a personal tie to the war or personal motivation mm. for me to explore the war. But the final analysis is a war is a war. It's, it's fascinating and brutal and it's so extreme that no journalist can help but be fascinated and want to, be, want to know more about it. And, and so that was the, it was it was pretty much the same impetus that drove me when I was writing following mm. fish is just to this drive to go out there and talk to people and figure out what life was like in thirty years of war. When did you start writing the book or working on the book? My first trip i mean I'd always gone back and forth to Sri Lanka in the two thousands. My first trip for the specific purpose of this book was in August two thousand ten I see uh, about a year <coughs> after an end to hostilities was declared. About a year after an end to hostilities was declared, uh, about three months after Following Fish came out. Mm. Uh, and I went there, you know, just on sort of a recce initially, just to kind of see what there was and figure out what kind of a book or book proposal I would mm. write. And then I moved to uh, Sri Lanka the next year in 2011. And I stayed there close to a year. Uh, uh, and then simultaneously also worked in trips to the UK and Canada mm. for some reporting. Um, I'd taken time off my job and sort of this was, this was all I was doing for the better part of 2011-12. One of the interesting things about this divided island is that it emerges through the book very clearly that what is considered the aftermath of a war mm. for those of us outside the frame is often just the war continuing for those who've experienced it. Yeah. Over and over you find people whose stories and whose conversations uh, recall history, some of it distant, some of it fairly recent. But the common thread is that for all these people and their memories seem to exist in a space where the war has never really ended. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the friction that kind of brought us, you know, set the war alight in the first place. Mm. I mean, so while the flames may have died down, but the friction continues to exist between these two communities, between a majoritarian impulse and sort of a minoritarian resentment. Mm. Uh, that friction continues to exist. It continues to play out in different ways, uh, which is, you're very right. I mean, an end to fighting is not necessarily an end to war mm. uh, or an end to hostility. Uh, it's an end to open hostility in the sense that no, to the two sides aren't sort of going at each other's throats with guns anymore, but uh, the tension plays out in very different kinds of ways. I mean, there's different types of repression of the minority, minority communities. Um, there are different, uh, you know, suspensions of civil liberties. Mm. Uh, so, so this was not something I actually expected to find, or maybe I expected to find it, but I didn't expect it. I didn't expect the continuity to be so strong. Mm. I didn't expect, I, I really thought when the war ended in May 2009 that it was sort of a watershed and that life would be vastly different uh, before and after. But the truth is that's never the case. I mean, you know, there, I mean, really there are very few watersheds in the real world ever, I mm. mean, which we should know. I mean, we're going through life of our lives of our own, but it's never obvious. Mm. And conflicts great and small throughout the world, I think, serve to teach us the same lesson. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, this is, I mean, one of the things that struck me and I was, as I was writing this book is that at some point, a lot of these, uh, I hate to call them lessons, but you know, or, or takeaways, which is even worse, it's sort of corporate jargon, but something that you can kind of infer from this book is that uh, these trends are applicable across the world. I mean, wherever there has been conflict, wherever there, wherever there has been war, um, there will be sort of seeds of tension and, uh, and resentment and hostility that carry on into the immediate future. And yet you found pockets of normalcy too. Normalcy 
not necessarily a new that there wasn't necessarily a new normal mm -hmm. that had sprung up after 2009 but normalcy that people had rested for themselves even in the midst of war that endured yeah absolutely i mean th this this was something i uh, you know i kind of used to talk to people about when i was discussing the book with them is that i what i was trying to figure out was you know what happens to your life when you're living in a country in which a war has gone on for 30 years you know it's all uh, almost 30 years it's two generations uh, your the average civilian's life is just sort of stretched and distorted and warped in ways that we cannot that you and I living in India cannot hope to understand because it's just its own unique thing mm. and i wanted to find that out and I, I wanted to find sort of the shapes that life takes uh, in this kind of uh, situation mm. and this was one of the things that i found is that basically however distorted your life seems and however far removed from normalcy it is there will be these pockets these sort of um, bastions of normalcy within your life that people will create for themselves and it's a testament to the life force itself i guess i mean that sounds a little uh, I, don't, I don't know how it's, it sounds too grandiose but i mean that's that's exactly what it is though. well if not grandiose terms for this i'm not sure <laughs> what else the most memorable image I have of this very phenomenon is you going, I think, perhaps to Jaffna, mm -hmm. where you discover sort of ancient makes of cars beautifully preserved on the roads, yeah. uh, you know, because uh, thanks to the exigencies of war. Yeah. Um, and you see past and present meld in ways that aren't necessarily painful. Yeah. What are the sort of journalistic strategies that stood you in good stead? when you were working on this book. How does a journalist go about reporting on the end of conflict and the aftermath of conflict? Well, the chapter you mentioned right now is actually one way. Um, it, it, it's my favorite chapter in the whole book because it's just, it, I, you know, I happened to go there and I happened to find these old cars kind of trundling, trundling about the streets of Jaffna. And suddenly I was presented with a very sort of unorthodox or unusual um, window into the war. I mean, it's not the usual window of death and destruction uh, but it's in these in the form of these weird sort of metal creatures that are going about the streets and so you could then take that and kind of play with it and you could approach the war from an oblique angle mm. and that was uh, not what I tried to do throughout the book but what I really loved to do I mean this was sort of uh, you know that complete the feature journalist in me kind of coming out and finding this bizarre angle into the war um, but journalistically speaking it was uh, it was important for me to be practical about sort of the readers who were going to read this book. There were people in Sri Lanka who had obviously lived with the war and knew it back to front. And there were people, that there will be people in India and the UK and the US who uh, know less and less about the war or have varying degrees of knowledge. So the, so the idea was to write a book that would present something new to everybody, and mm. which meant that I had to find new ways to tell the history of the war. Uh, which has otherwise been retold everywhere. I mean, it's you know, there's a Wikipedia entry on it, and people know why it started and ended, and how the fighting progressed. But it was important for me to find a new way to package that. I mean, and and tell it. And so I found sort of people who could carry the burden of that mm. history through their own life stories. I mean, this was something that I d I think I do repeatedly in the book is just to find one person or a group of a small group of people and narrate their stories, and through that kind of present the arc of history. Indeed. Um, Much of the book is told in the voices of these people whom you come into contact with both throughout Sri Lanka and outside the country. Yeah, and the voice is actually, uh, the voice is crucial because I mean it gives it that kind of texture that you know I could never give if I just sat down and attempted to write sort of a brief summary of the Sri Lankan war. Mm. Uh, the voice is everything. The voice gives it life and it gives, you know, it gives you uh, a sense of the person and therefore a sense of his or her situation. The other thing that I uh, that I wanted to do was also make this a book of place. Mm. Um, not in the way that we think of when we think of a travelogue necessarily, uh, but to root it so firmly in Sri Lanka that when you read the book, you may not know everything about the Sri Lankan war necessarily. <coughs> that was never the idea of the book, but you do know what the country of Sri Lanka feels like as a place. Mm. And so what this, what this land was in which the war raged for 30 years. Um, and that was something I attempted to do again and again, sort of pr write about the geography, write about the terrain, write about, you know, uh, again, banal 
things, seemingly banal things like food and drink, and which in the context of a war may seem insignificant, mm. but which are the stuff of daily life. And the stuff of daily life was what I was attempting to write about throughout the book. Indeed, and sometimes through travel, through the banalities of travel, one can make out just how a land has changed uh, from what it was to what it is. Yeah. Taking a train at midnight, yeah. um, taking a road through regions and coming across police barrier after police yeah. barrier. Yeah. But I want to return our conversation to something you touched on earlier, which was about talking to people. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that occurred to me as I was reading the book is that it was necessarily shaped by the stories that people told you and I wondered did you come across I mean were there a set of people who were more likely to speak to you than others? Not a set per se I mean I I, I, I was up against sort of various interesting handicaps when I did this book I'm an Indian Tamil hmm. <coughs> and so because I'm an Indian I'm not trusted very much by the Sri Lankan, gov or Sri Lankan government but also by the Sinhalese people um, because I'm an Indian Tamil the Sri Lankan Tamils don't ten tend to trust you that much. At the same time, however, I have one advantage in the fact that I speak Tamil, and so therefore there's, you know, that particular barrier has been crossed. Mm. So, um, so on both sides, uh, on the Tamil side and the Sinhalese side, I found sort of a certain reluctance uh, to open up immediately. I mean, it was, uh, but that's understandable also. You know, they're Indeed. coming out of a war. These are sensitive times, and um, uh, and so I did, you know, sort of what all uh, journalists aspire to do which is basically to just stick on like a leech to somebody who you want to talk to and hope at some point you will annoy them so much that they will talk to you just to get you off their back <laughs> uh, so I did that repeatedly I mean I hung around until people were comfortable with me hmm. I uh, in some cases it didn't work I mean there's in the chapter that you talked about the the cars you know I go to one garage again and again repeatedly and he never opens up I mean he talks to me in snatches but it's not like I know get come away getting to know the person indeed um, so it, it didn't kind of break down neatly by community or by sets of people. It's just it was it, it was difficult across the board. I mean, I think it, there were very few instances where I would meet somebody and they would kind of um, talk to me instantly and effusively. And if they did that, it was time to be suspicious because then that clearly meant that there was an agenda somewhere that was driving that openness. Indeed. Yeah. You know, this is a genre of some lo of some standing now. The um, a work in which the process is journalistic, hmm. but the output output tends to be literary, by hmm. which I mean it tends to address questions about you know, the human condition as much as it does about the process of day-to-day -day life yeah. or about politics or you know, the political economy. Yeah. Uh, did you have other writers to take as your models as you worked on this book? Uh, there were actually several. I mean, the, the, the primary book that I kind of uh, looked to as sort of a touchstone was a book called Stasiland. This is a book by an Australian writer called Anna Funder. And Anna Funder basically goes to East Germany um, quite a few years after the fall of the Berlin Wall in the mid-90s, I believe. Uh, and she looks back at sort of, again, the way in which the texture of daily life in East Germany was shaped by the Stasi. What did it mean when one out of every three people could be an informer. What did it mean when your spouse could be an informer informing on you? And what does it do to sort of your mental condition when uh, our regular processes of thought and condition are replaced by paranoia and fear? Uh, and so she, she mapped this, and she mapped this by just talking to the people who were involved uh, from various angles. And that was, you know, that was exactly what I wanted to do. And it was, as you say, I mean, it was purely journalistic in technique, but the book that came out was even more than my book, in fact, so novelistic. I mean, it was as if you were reading uh, a novel about life in East Germany. It mm. was, uh, it was a, it was, it was a masterpiece. I mean, it is a masterpiece. Uh, so that was sort of, and then there was, you know, several other books uh, in that genre, uh, perhaps not quite as novelistic. Mm. I mean, you know, Wendell Stevenson wrote a couple of books about her travels in Georgia and then in Iraq. Um, so I, 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 I would look at all these as, uh, as sort of my predecessors, if you, if you will, um, people who had done this and who had done it so well that clearly there was, there was, there was a culture in which I could follow along. I dare say you've produced a book that could stand alongside the best of them. Thank you. Thank you, Saman. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. We have with us here Miss Naomi Munavira 
who is uh, a Sri Lankan writer, but currently based in California. Is that right? Yes. All right. So, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your upbringing? Were you brought up in Colombo? Um, well, we left uh, Sri Lanka when I was three years old, and we moved to Nigeria. So I was in Nigeria from the age of three till twelve, and then in '84 there were um, there was political upheaval in in Nigeria. Um, as you might know, so we had to leave quite quickly and we immigrated to Los Angeles and I've been um, in California since then. So this is your first book, uh, Island of a Thousand Mirrors, and yes. it was on the shortlist for the DSC Prize. Yes. Congratulations yes. on that. Thank so, you. So um, is this an attempt to sort of get back to your roots and to understand more about where you've come from? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think it was more an attempt to wrap my head around the Sri Lankan Civil War. Okay. So the book is about two families, one Tamil, one Sinhala, um, attempting to deal with and survive the Civil War that went on, as you know, for 26 years. Um, and so I grew up outside Sri Lanka, but we would spend quite a bit of time in Sri Lanka. Every year we would be there for two to three months. So I had a good sense of what was happening there. You know, there were buses being blown up and buildings being attacked and then you know on TV you would see that Tamil villages had been attacked um, so I sort of had a sense of it um, so I wouldn't say it's a attempt to get back at my roots but it is uh, sort of you know right when writers are writing a book they're working out an obsession they're trying to figure out what their relationship is to a certain thing so I think my obsession when I was writing this book was very much trying to understand what happened in that war Right, and also perhaps to get a, a personal understanding of what took place because you, you may have gauged reports through the media or right, right. through television what, right. what was happening. Yeah, I mean, I think my primary concern was um, taking it outside the political and making it very human. Like, what did people suffer? What did people go through? What did Tamil people and Sinhala people? At the end of the day, outside the political context, outside the sort of... Um, government or LTT politics, you know, these are human beings going through suffering. And I was really interested in trying to understand the psychology or the psyche of what happens when you're under this kind of um, trauma. Can you tell us a little bit about the structure of the book? Sure. Um, it's told, it's two first person narratives. Um, Yasodhara, who is the elder daughter of the Singhala family, talks for most of the book. She uh, actually like halfway through the book. So. Um, it's her talking in first person and she's talking about the family and growing up in Colombo and then the starting the rumblings of the war coming, the riots in 83. Um, due to the riots in 83, the family immigrates to California and then she takes up her story there. Um, sort of in the middle, it's a little unusual, the structure. In the middle of the book, Saraswati, who is the daughter of the Tamil family, starts talking and she is in the north of the country going through active warfare. Right. And are they at all related or do they meet at they're, any time? They're Mr. not Fowler? related. Um, the, towards the end of the book, they are, the, they're talking interspliced. So it's dovetailed Saraswati Yasodhara, Saraswati right. Yasodhara. And um, they don't actively meet, but there is a traumatic event that happens that links them. Yeah, but I don't want to give away too much. Right, of course. And uh, I'm just curious, how was this book received in, in, uh, in Sri Lanka? Have people been happy and open to yeah, um, Tamilians as well as the Sinhalese? Yeah, absolutely. Like when, if people read the book, they understand that my project was like outside um, politics and outside being pro this or that, you know. So um, I wasn't interested in writing a book that was pro either side. I was interested in talking about human suffering. So if they read the book, they understand that and I've got really positive responses about that. Well, that's, that's wonderful. And uh, would you like to read a little passage from sure, your book? Sure, sure. Um, so I think I will read from early in the book. And this is a passage that, um, it's to set it up, it's right after colonization ends and it gives you a little insight into what is coming in terms of the war. Behind the retreating Englishman on the new nation's flag is poised a stylized lion, all curving flank and ornate muscle, a long cruel sword gripped in its front paw. It is the ancient symbol of the Singhala who believe that they are descended from the lovemaking between an exiled Indian princess and a large jungle cat. A green stripe represents that small and much tossed Muslim population. An orange stripe represents the larger Tamil minority. But in the decades that are coming, 
race riots and discrimination will render the orange stripe inadequate. It will be replaced by a new flag. On its face, a snarling tiger, all bared feng and bristling whisker. If the idea of militancy is not conveyed strongly enough, dagger-clawed paws burst forth while crossed rifles rear over the cat's head. A rifle-toting tiger, a sword-gripping lion. This is a war which will be waged between related beasts.